Today, most wild places remain wild only because they're protected by law. Ever since the creation of the world's first national park here in the United States, the idea of setting aside wilderness has become an international phenomenon. High in the Italian Alps, for example, there is a spectacular national park called Gran Paradiso. Man has lived in this region for thousands of years, herding, planting, and hunting at will. But now, all that is changing. Against all odds, the park is succeeding in re-establishing a wilderness. Its greatest triumph is the flourishing population of alpine ibex, which were once on the verge of extinction. The sounds of its clashing horns ring out once more in the crisp mountain air of Gran Paradiso. an alpine wilderness in the mountains of northwest Italy, a national park that takes its name from the region's highest peak, a 13,000-foot giant called Gran Paradiso. It's a haven for alpine wildlife, like the graceful chamois, and the powerful golden eagle. But it's famous above all for one animal, the magnificent alpine ibex. For centuries, the ibex was hunted almost to extinction. In the whole of the Alps, fewer than 100 survived. Gran Paradiso was their final refuge. In 1821, this precious corner of Italy was finally protected. Today, the descendants of those last few ibex number in the thousands. It's December, mating season for the ibex. For most of the year, the two sexes live apart, but during the rut, females are surrounded by eager males. Odor is an influential part of ibex courtship, so the male adds to his personal scent with strong-smelling urine. The right approach is also important. A waggling tongue may entice other females, but it seems to leave this prospective partner unimpressed. This male isn't taken too seriously because he's still young. The serious contenders for mates are the older males identifiable by their great sweep of horn. Most contests are merely symbolic displays. Each combatant flaunts his strength, his horns, and his audacity. It's more like a parade of goods than a battle. But when bluff fails, there are fights. In addition to simple pushing and shoving, each male tries to get the height advantage. These fights can last for hours, since it's usually well-matched opponents that carry competition to this extreme. As the new year begins, the park is enveloped in a frozen blanket.
New snow piles upon the old. It cloaks the mountains with what can be a deadly beauty, even for the most expert of rock climbers, the chamois. Heavy snowfall is a warning that it's time to withdraw to the valleys below. Sometimes their retreat is too late. Each year, scores of chamois and ibex die in avalanches. These winter waterfalls of ice and snow leave behind welcome carrion for the scavengers, the golden eagles, ravens, hawks, and crows. A golden eagle casually glides in to usurp the small scavenger. Though a superb hunter, it takes full advantage of a free meal. The crow relinquishes its meal, but not without protest. At this difficult time of year, there's plenty of competition around, and there's a keen edge to the constant battle for survival. But another eagle has its eyes on the same meal. Even this mighty predator must sometimes give way. Its hooked beak and sharp claws serve the eagle well when tearing apart the frozen carcasses left behind by the cruel winter. In the season's freezing grip, it's every eagle for himself. The alpine winter advances, accompanied by strong winds and bitter cold. Blizzards pile deeper and deeper mounds of snow on top of vegetation. Grand Paradiso's wildlife is now put to its biggest test. Ibex scrape a meager living from the February hillsides. Down in the valleys, their food is buried even deeper. Even in April, the snow continues to fall. Park residents await the warmth of spring. A red pole, already in breeding plumage, huddles against the final blows of winter's winds. Rummaging through the alder catkins, he finds the last of autumn seeds. But even the longest winter draws to a close. Melting snow reveals patches of earth, streams begin to flow, and migrant birds return to the valleys 
of Grand Paradiso. A white wagtail forages along the cold mountain stream. This bird prefers the stream side, cold or not, but it likes to keep its tail high and dry. It's easy to see why it's called a wagtail. It catches the first insects of the new season, a sign that life will soon be different here. Spring comes gently to Grand Paradiso. The soft song of birds at dawn greets the changing season. Black grouse begin to gather on their traditional mating grounds while the earth is still covered with slippery ice and snow. The males display together, hoping to attract mates with their elaborate prancing. Most of this activity is also accompanied by a variety of calls, from gobbles to crowing. The fanning of tails, puffing out of plumage, and flapping of wings is all part of a very energetic competition aimed to prove to the female who is the best of the bunch. These colorful displays have inspired males and females of another species. There's a popular European folk dance fashioned after this annual courtship ritual. Soon, the crisp air is warmed under the radiance of the sun. Anemones and crocuses herald the new season. It's spring in Grand Paradiso. The alpine pastures come alive. For the water pipits, breeding season has just begun. Time for flights of fancy. The males are busy performing their solo musicals, well choreographed aerial displays of song and dance. These flights serve a dual purpose. The male stakes a claim to his own patch of meadow and hopefully attracts a female to it at the same time. Violet blue gentians bloom in clusters as spring progresses up the mountain slopes. Lower down in the valley, orchids decorate the woodlands. These forests are a mix of trees, aspen, poplar, larch, and fir. And the woods are full of new activity. Woodpeckers are nesting in these poplars. This male black woodpecker has been sitting on eggs, but soon the female will come to replace him. As the male flies off to find food, the female dashes in to take over, carefully checking out the situation at the entrance before going in.
This boreal owl depends on abandoned woodpecker holes. Once found, they quietly nestle into what seems like a perfect fit of size and color. With a little remodeling, the nuthatch also uses woodpecker holes. They fill in the mouth of the hole with mud, narrowing the opening to match its own smaller size. This also keeps out predators. By late May, there's a carpet of new grass on the valley floors. This entices the ibex down from the mountains. It's their first chance to regain the weight they lost over the winter. The hungry males graze intently, meeting this white wagtail eye to eye. It's waiting to catch the insects flushed out by all the activity. This position may look awkward, but it helps the ibex reach the new spring growth. Judging by the annual growth rings on their horns, these males are about 10 years old. The mating season has ended, and the females are living their separate lives. But the males still engage in their trials of strength. Each year, the hierarchy is re-established by sparring. It doesn't take much provocation to instigate head-to-head -head combat. These high arcing displays and horn wrestling are practice for the real thing. If you don't have your own opponent, there's always the option of joining someone else's fight. There's more to this thrashing of trees than meets the eye. Ibex have scent glands on their faces. Marking the trees lets other males know who's around. In the woods below, the black woodpecker's eggs have hatched. Both parents are now fully occupied bringing food to the demanding chicks. The female returns with food stored in her crop. The chicks are fed for 20 days, after which they will leave the nest. She keeps a watchful eye out for predators such as pine martens, which find the hatchlings easy prey. By June, spring has reached even the highest alpine meadows. Marmots have emerged from hibernation.
They've spent the winter huddled together in communal burrows. With seemingly playful tussles, the young from earlier years are driven off to establish new colonies. Some youngsters are more reluctant to leave than others. Pregnant female ibex have moved to the safety of the precipitous cliffs of Gran Paradiso to give birth. These traditional calving grounds are used year after year. Though they're only a few days old, the youngsters are already practicing the butting of heads. Wolves were once the main threat to young ibex, but they were hunted until there were no more. Now the greatest danger is the golden eagle. Though the eagle couldn't carry off these ibex from flat ground, they can try to use the steep cliffs to their advantage. By drifting down to its nest below and holding on with all its might, sometimes they do succeed. The majestic golden eagle is the last great predator of Gran Paradiso. It can take young chamois and ibex, but it's usually smaller prey, such as hares and marmots, that make up an eagle chick's diet. Food isn't the only thing that's brought to the nest. Almost every day, new branches are added. This is simply nest maintenance, but in grand Golden Eagle style. The parents tear them from trees as much as a mile away.
This eagle has killed a young chamois. It's a heavy load for even this powerful bird of prey, but with a hungry chick to feed, it's worth the effort. Getting it back to the nest, however, is a different story. This is usually done piece by piece because it's a real battle to hold on to such a large meal. Once again, the eagle will search Gran Paradiso, but this time for lighter prey. This baby marmot was born a month earlier, deep underground. Only now is it starting to explore the outside world. Marmots live in colonies. Each has its own territory with a complex of holes and tunnels. There can be more than one adult female in the group, but only one breeds each year. So these young marmots are brothers and sisters. Bonding is established and maintained through a very specific family smell. After emergence, baby marmots learn the behaviors needed to become members of this complex society. By July, the high alpine meadows are a playground for young animals of many kinds. These are baby chamois, two months old, and growing in strength and agility. Their mothers often leave them on their own while they go off to graze. Just a couple of females remain to look after this young group or creche. The young bounce around comically with what seems endless energy. But this play is good preparation for life on the steep slopes of Gran Paradiso. Chamois are among the most agile of mountain wildlife. The chamois don't have the summer pastures all to themselves. The park is less than a three-hour drive from Milan and Turin and the hot, humid plains of northern Italy. Visitors by the thousands flock to the mountains. In summer, as many as 400 a day may climb to the very summit of Gran Paradiso.
What they come to see is this, the ibex, the symbol of Gran Paradiso. Everyone wants to go home with at least one picture. For the alpine chuff, leftovers are a welcome addition to their usual diet of insects. Well-fed hikers take their ease. While chuffs clean up the waste. For most animals, though, the influx of visitors brings little benefit. And there is yet another invasion to contend with. In midsummer, cows are driven up to the high pastures to share the grazing grounds with ibex and chamois. 90% of the land in the national park is privately owned. And although traditional ways of farming are on the decline, grazing rights are still exercised. For three months each year, the herds are kept at summer farmsteads high in the mountains. Their milk is made into butter and cheese. Gran Paradiso is far from being a trackless wilderness. Several thousand people live in the valleys that penetrate deep into the park. The villages still retain their old world charm, but only because park regulations limit the freedom to build or repair using anything other than traditional materials. Many local people resent the restrictions the national park brings. They feel they should be able to do what they want with their own land and property. After all, their ancient farming methods have done much to create this pastoral landscape. Away from the villages and the tourists, there's still serenity and refuge for the ibex. The females have brought their young down off the cliffs. The mothers need the easier grazing of the more gentle slopes. And the young are big enough now to be safe from eagles. Few visitors to the park will see these ibex. Mothers stay well away from the hiking trails. For ibex and chamois, this is the lazy time of year.
It's August. The male ibex are in the mountains, fattening up for the rigors of the rut and the winter to come. Higher up, there's still snow on the glacial peaks. And spring is just reaching the edge of the ice up here. When the first flowers are blooming, it's already autumn in the valleys below. The green of Arola pines stands out among the larch. These trees have a special relationship with a curious bird, the nutcracker. Nutcrackers eat pine seeds which are concealed under the scales of the cone. They're too heavy for wind dispersal and rely on nutcrackers for that. The nutcracker extracts most of the seeds with ease. But if a cone is too tightly closed, it pulls it off the tree, takes it to a suitable anvil, and hammers it open. It doesn't eat the seeds right away. They're stored in its crop. Then it flies off as much as a mile from the tree and buries the seeds. These well-hidden meals will provide an important food supply in the winter. In the months to come, the nutcracker will find many of the seeds, but some will be forgotten. These will germinate and grow into new trees. That's how Arola pines come to grow high on the majestic mountain ridges of Gran Paradiso. As the first snows of winter powder the hillsides, the chamois rut begins. They've grown thick winter coats, and the males make themselves look even more impressive by erecting a crest of hair along their backs. These nimble chamois are well adapted to life on the slippery mountain slopes, dashing up and down with great ease. These chases will re-establish the hierarchy. 
Their mastery of the jagged terrain is a marvel of nature. Inside the park, the chamois have few enemies. Outside, beyond the boundaries, it's different. Here, hunting is legal, but it's strictly regulated. A license allows each hunter to kill only two chamois, and they have to report every kill at once. Each area has its quota, and once it's been reached, the season is closed. Hunting has a long history in these mountains. It wasn't always so controlled, and ibex, as well as chamois, were killed. Ironically, the park owes its very existence to hunting. This is Castello di Sari, just north of Gran Paradiso. At one time, it was a royal hunting lodge, and it's decorated with the horns of a thousand ibex. Each dark curve on this painted ceiling is an ibex horn. Every white patch on this wall was a skull of ibex or chamois. Gran Paradiso became a hunting preserve in 1821 because of concerns for the future of the ibex as a sporting quarry. They were protected so they could build in numbers and be hunted again. More than a century later, in 1922, Gran Paradiso became a national park, and hunting was outlawed. Today, park rangers carry guns of a different sort, because the ibex have a new problem, overpopulation. The last wolves and lynx were killed long ago, so predators no longer curb their numbers. In a hard winter, many die of starvation and disease. To avoid this, some of these surplus ibex are captured each year and taken to other parts of the Alps to found new populations. They're shot with a dart that injects a powerful tranquilizer. Until the drug takes effect, the park rangers stay back. The farther the ibex runs, the harder it will be to retrieve. Even so, they don't always go down in the most convenient place. Rangers risk their own lives to retrieve the drugged ibex.
This stage of the recovery is critical. The animal is still conscious, and one step would take it over the edge. Once it's recovered, it will be given a brief medical examination and marked with a numbered ear tag for identification. The animals are loaded into crates and driven overnight to their new home. They're destined for the mountains above Lake Como, east of the park. The goal is to reintroduce the ibex into various regions of the Alps. Almost 50 new populations have been established in this way. But there's still too many ibex in Gran Paradiso, and some people believe hunting should be allowed inside the park, or that wolves and lynx should be reintroduced to control the overpopulation. And there may be bigger problems ahead than just too many ibex. All over the Alps, the old way of life is dying. Young people leave for the cities. Farms are abandoned and decay. Local people argue that they need some new means of earning a living to reverse the drift from the land. But national park regulations forbid what some see as the solution. Monte Bianco, near Gran Paradiso. This is what's happening over much of the Alps. Developing Gran Paradiso's villages as ski resorts would allow local hotels to remain open for much of the year, not just for the short summer season. But that would mean disfiguring the mountains with pylons and cutting great tracks through the forest. So far, these pressures have been resisted. Gran Paradiso has only one small ski lift. There is some skiing in the national park, but most of it is cross country. Although much less damaging to the environment than downhill skiing, it's not entirely benign. When food is scarce, any disturbance pushes the tenuous survival of Gran Paradiso's wildlife to the limit. So, who is Gran Paradiso for? Is it for the visitors who come to see a supposedly pristine wilderness?
Is it for the local people struggling to make a living? Or is it for the animals, these last reminders of an Ice Age Europe that still miraculously survive? All over the world, those who would preserve our natural heritage face the same dilemma. The answers to these questions have relevance far beyond the boundaries of Gran Paradiso. Nature is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you, your gas company, and America's natural gas industry. Developing new ways to use clean gas energy to generate electricity and fuel vehicles to help meet America's goal for cleaner air. And by Siemens Engineering Solutions in electronic components and medical systems. Telecommunications, energy, and automation. Siemens. Join Dan Small, Nancy Frank, Larry Bandy, Linda Seeslick, Tom Neubauer, and Ron Anderson as they explore outdoor Wisconsin, next at 9 on Channel 10. On the Wing, The Life of Birds from Feathers to Flight by Bruce Brooks, a companion book to the Nature series, is available in bookstores everywhere. This is PBS.